cordial welcome to each and every one of you on this 17th Sunday after the Festival of Pentecost, also officially our first Sunday in the fall season, and it's good to be with you, and hopefully it's good for every one of us to be together on this uh, Sunday in our service of worship. Our announcements are that uh, on this new Bible study that we're going to be having uh, is going to be, interestingly enough, the very same uh, uh, title of my sermon today, which was not planned in advance, and that is, What Do You Think? And it just so happened that the Bible study that Fred has selected, and the, and the a quote from the gospel lesson of Jesus is, What Do You Think? So it came together rather well today. Also a very important day uh, for the Judeo-Christian world is that uh, today is the, be is the beginning of Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, and uh, in our newsletter, which you will have one to send home with you today, the pastor's paragraph has to do with both Rosh Hashanah, which is our Jewish New Year's, which was on September the 18th, and basically 10 days later is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And one of the things that's interesting as uh, we uh, observe these festivals with our Jew as, as part of the Judeo-Christian tradition is that the word scapegoat as is came from the uh, practice in the 1500s of uh, sending out a scapegoat in which a rabbi placed the sins of the people on the head of the goat and sent the goat in out <laughs> out so that's where we get the term scapegoat but that for your edification mostly for my fun but that's our uh, theme in our newsletter today under the pastor's paragraphs so you'll you may find out even in a couple of paragraphs more than you want to know about that. But since uh, Jesus Christ was a Jew, it's important for us to keep that in mind also as we observe that in our own church life. Are there any other announcements for us today that have not been? No? Well, it's just good to be all, all of us together today. So, and you may remain seated until we have the closing benediction. So let's join in singing our opening song, number 580, We Are Called to Be God's People.
Let us join our voices as one as we pray together. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, sustains us, and all of creation. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Our sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. Let us be in prayer. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. In all the world, give your church unity. Inspire all the baptized with the mind of Christ. Where the church is powerful and where it struggles, shape us with humility and obedience so that your love may be at work in us. Your Son took on all of bodily life in our world, even to death. Preserve and keep your creation, O God. Mend and redeem places that are polluted and damaged so all of creation confesses you as Lord. Our lives are yours, O God. Relieve the suffering of those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit. Defend the lives and welfare of children who are abused or neglected, hungry or exploited, bullied or lonely. Turn this congregation away from our own interests toward the interests of others. Fill us with your compassion and sympathy. Bless ministries of care in our community. Make us into signs of your mercy and justice for our neighbors. Thank you for those who have gone into the kingdom ahead of us, tax collectors and prostitutes, likely and unlikely, obedient and slow to learn. By their witness, teach us to confess Jesus Christ as Lord in life and in death. All these things and whatever else you see we need, we entrust to your mercy. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Let us join our voices as one as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our lessons will be shared for, with us by our lectors today, Shirley and Darlene. Good morning. The first lesson is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, Philippians 2, verses 1 through 13. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than our, yourselves. 
Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not, rega <clears throat> did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as, you, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The psalm today is Psalm 78, verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 16. The refrain is, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Hear the words of my mouth. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old things that we have heard and known, that our ancestors have told us. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Hear the words of my mouth. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Hear the words of my mouth. In the sight of their ancestors, he worked marvels in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zon. He divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the waters stand like a heap. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Hear the words of my mouth. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud and all night long with a fiery light. He split rocks open in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Give ear, O oh my people, to my teaching. Hear the words of my mouth. The reading from the Holy Gospel of St. Matthew. Matthew 21, 23 through 32. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven? or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, The first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your mind and believe him. 
the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson from Gospel of Matthew, which we've been reading from, is an interesting exchange between Jesus and the Pharisees. Are there, they were gathered there, the chief priests and elders, as they're called in the text. And uh, it says that they came to Jesus while he was teaching. So here was Jesus in the temple precincts teaching, and the authorities of the temple came to Jesus because, of course, they were questioning him, so they had a bit of an exchange. The Pharisees said, by what authority are you here, Jesus, teaching? Well, Jesus uh, went back and uh, said, uh, I got a question for you. That's always, you know, kind of the way of a teacher. I have a question for you. If you tell me the answer, then I'll also tell you by what authority. So you have to tell me an answer, and I will tell you the answer. So it goes until finally we get to that question a few words of what do you think and there we have the beginning of what I am going to be speaking about today after this rather I would suppose contentious exchange between the rabbi named Jesus who was very very popular and the uh, temple authorities and Jesus was right there in the temple 
What do you think? Is the question very easy words in this gospel lesson. A group of military leaders succeeded in building a very powerful supercomputer able to solve any problem, large or small, strategic or tactical. These military leaders assembled in front of the new machine for a demonstration. The engineer conducting the demonstration instructed the, uh, these officers to feed a difficult tactical problem into the computer. They proceeded to describe a hypothetical situation to the computer and then asked the pivotal question, attack or retreat? This enormous supercomputer hummed away for about an hour and then printed out a one-word answer, yes. Well, the generals looked at each other, stupefied. Finally, one of them submits a second request to the computer, yes, what? Instantly, the computer responds, yes, sir. Yes, sir. The chief priests and elders, Pharisees like, were like those generals. They were accustomed to people saying, yes, sir. So when they come into this temple with Jesus there, why they find that they have an authority problem because people are not saying, yes, sir, to those Pharisees. They were the religious authorities, used to being treated like generals, I suppose, but there was a new teacher in town. There was a new rabbi. He was threatening. They feared his popularity, his ability to heal, his good preaching capacities, and he was drawing and leading people away from religious traditions they were afraid. They were afraid of that, that defined the Jews. So they set out to expose Jesus as a fraud. It was in this context Jesus asks the question, what do you think? He went to the first and said is a story he went about a man who had two sons. The man went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. The boy immediately said, no. Later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to his other son and said the same thing. This one answered, okay, but he never got out to the vineyard. Then Jesus asked the simple question, which of the two did what his father wanted? First, they answered. Then Jesus delivered the punchline. I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Likely, the ears of the crowds perked up, and they thought, how dare he assert that tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God before the Pharisees? Didn't he know Pharisees were too good to be lumped together with others like that? Didn't he know people with right credentials would be the king in the kingdom of God? What was Jesus talking about? Why was he excoriating the best people in town? The Pharisees, the clergy, what do you think? Well, first of all, what is so shocking here is God's grace. God's grace is shown here. Grace to people like yourselves and me, like us. Amazing grace. This is what Jesus is talking about. Amazing grace that even can save a wretch like me. God's grace is indeed shocking. It's like opening the windows of a darkened room and the sun shines in. People view God through the breakdown of others, 
but God breaks down the barriers of our lives. Barriers of everything that we hold true and sometimes dear. Jesus is talking about what types of people are acceptable to stand before the holy, holy, holy God. And he passes over the religious professionals in favor of the worst of the sinners. Has he lost his mind? Maybe we don't have to earn God's love after all. Maybe God loves us because God created us and calls us by name as God's children. God loves us even when we fail. A parent always loves his or her child, even in failure. It is wonderful to be upheld and loved in that way. It seems so simple, yet so powerful. God's arms are open to everyone, from every race, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every walk of life, every circumstance. God's arms are open. Come unto me. We really miss something when we put boundaries on God's grace. What do you think? Sometimes those boundaries are so superficial Dr. James Dobson, many of us may know Dr. Dobson with his work as an evangelist, Christian author, a family worker, tells about his daughter, Dana. Dana was an attractive baby and a toddler. As a toddler, Dobson noted that people paid a special attention to her, mainly because she was so cute. But when people saw her, they did so because she was cute and attractive. But when Dana was 15 months old, she fell and injured her mouth. Her mouth took on a lopsided shape, which altered her appearance. Overnight, the world seemed to treat Dana differently. Strangers no longer ooed and awed over her. Admiring glances turned into awkward stares. Dana had not changed in the least. She was still a vivacious, smart, loving toddler. But many no longer saw her that way. They no longer embraced and encouraged her because of her outward appearance. It is so important that we look upon the heart and not the outer appearance. The Pharisee's mind God only had regard for that which was an appearance, that which appeared to be perfect, that which appeared to be unblemished, that which appeared to be without defect. They reduced God to the level of human beings turning their backs on little girls and little boys because of crooked mouths. The Pharisees had no concept of God's grace in God's kingdom. Nearly the entire ministry of Jesus Christ is about the kingdom of God, God's kingdom. I believe all, if, if not all, nearly all, the parables of Jesus in the Gospels are about the kingdom, reminding us that even you and I can enter the kingdom of God not because of our works, but because of God's love for us. He could bring hurting people into the kingdom. Jesus brought people in, with love and acceptance, not with rules and objections. He did it by living out God's amazing, startling, absurd grace. An amazing grace. What do you think? Secondly, this is how we're to live our lives. Live a life that is grace-filled because God has graced us with Jesus. We're to value all people as worthy, to introduce them to the one who died on their behalf and on our behalf. Millions of people have been inspired by Mel Gibson's movie, The Passions of the Christ. 
Maxine, Ra Maxine Rains, Director of Ministry to the Homeless in Knoxville, Tennessee, knew her homeless friends couldn't afford to buy a ticket to see that movie. So Maxine brought the movie to the people. She set up a large screen under a downtown bridge in Knoxville where the homeless gathered daily and nightly. And there was a group of some 400 homeless people there to see the movie by Mel Gibson. The film was shown to those street people. Many were moved to tears. They were amazed. Dozens prayed to receive Christ as their personal savior. Rains commented, I want them to be able to see somebody cared enough for them to give his life for them. They tell me they are hopeless, that no one can help them. And I say to them, I know the one who can. That one who can is Jesus the Christ, who is suffering on the cross, took upon himself our own shortcomings. Nobody is hopeless. Nobody is lost. Maxine Rains took the kingdom of God, the people of God. And thirdly, no one is excluded from the kingdom of God, not even Pharisees. If the Pharisees can make it, so can we. All they knew is they were forgiven and God washed them. That's what the tax collectors and prostitutes knew. They were forgiven. Jesus offered his kingdom for all. In 1962, James Meredith made history as the first black student to enroll at the University of Mississippi. This simple act inspired vicious race riots in the surrounding town, but Meredith didn't let it intimidate him. Four years later, and I recall this as being part of being in seminary, and some of the seminarians went to the South, to Memphis. Four years later, in a bid to inspire black citizens in the South to vote, James Meredith planned a walk from Memphis, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi. He carried nothing but a Bible and a walking stick. The 220 mile walk, an effort to show that a black man could freely walk through the South. Meredith commented, I was at war against fear. On the second day of his walk, however, James Meredith was ambushed by Aubrey James Norville, a Memphis hardware clerk. Norville shot Meredith four times and left him to die in the middle of the highway. But Meredith did not die. Incredibly, he was taken to the hospital and survived the shooting. Then a remarkable thing happened. As he was recuperating in the hospital, dozens then hundreds, then thousands gathered to continue his walk from Memphis to Jackson. On the last day, he recovered James Meredith, accompanied by some 12,000 marchers entered Mississippi's state capital of Jackson. This is what the kingdom of God will be like. One man slain on a cross, starting a parade of dozens, then hundreds, then thousands, and then millions and billions over the years. People who are healed by the wounds of the Master. By his stripes, we are healed. What do you think? 
The kingdom of God is a central message, as I said in Jesus' ministry. The kingdom of God is coming. We just prayed for that. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Nothing can prevail against it, not even the gates of hell. God's grace is salvation. We cannot earn it. It is a free gift when we affirm our faith in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Let us believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior, and claim our place in the kingdom of God. God says in Jesus and to us, come unto me, each and every one of you, and I will give you peace. Thanks be to God. May we go forth from this place strengthened, filled with the peace of one whom we call our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I invite us now through with our leader, and I'm not going to step on your words here. <laughs> Fred, if you would lead us in the Apostles' Creed as we find it printed in our worship folders. Fred. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting.
able as Fred will share with us the blessings of the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We are reminded also of our offering each week. This is very significant in the life of the congregation and the larger church and that they're offering baskets at the entrance as we leave, or I guess at the exit. The entrance becomes an exit as we leave. So uh, they are there as a reminder to us of the work of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's go forth today and have a wonderful and beautiful and safe week and see you next week. Depart in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have greatness. Thank you.